Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to this very special webinar organized by Inner News Art Journalism Network. I'm Stella Paul, uh, Environment and Health Project Officer at EJN, and I'm your moderator for the day. Today, our webinar is focused on something that we have been living into for the past one and a half years. Uh, we, and we still don't understand a lot about it. And today we will be trying to share with you a lot of information that you probably have been looking forward to for some time. Uh, our focus area uh, is uh, zoonotic diseases spillover ecosystem. And uh, to help us understand uh, this very important and yet little understood subject, we have a very brilliant lineup of panelists here, uh, starting with Deborah Kochiver, uh, who is uh, the uh, renowned veterinarian scientist and uh, a leader of a global project focused on zoonotic diseases. I will be coming back to introduce uh, Deborah shortly. And we have Nadia Rimi uh, with us, yet another scientist. And then finally, we have Musa Sengari, who uh, is having a bit of technical issues right now uh, because he is on the field. Um, and we, but we will be, uh, you know, he will be sharing uh, information with us moving forward. Um, and uh, before I introduce our panelists, uh, I want to just share a few words, words about uh, the logistics of this uh, webinar today. First, uh, we will be spending uh, about 90 minutes together, of which one hour uh, we will be listening to our panelists uh, and who will be sharing their, their presentations. And then we have half hour dedicated to uh, answering your questions. Uh, we do encourage you highly to uh, post your questions uh, using the Q&A button that is at the bottom of your screen. Please don't post your questions meant for the panelists at the chat box that is for chatting with your fellow attendees. We will be screening your questions regularly and we will make sure that uh, we get you an expert's answer as much as possible. Um, we, and we will be sharing the recording of this event once we have wrapped up so that you do not miss out on anything important uh, because of technical or any other reasons. So with that, uh, let me introduce uh, now to our lead panelist today, uh, Deborah Kuchivar. Uh, Deborah, uh, if you can, yes. <laughs> Deborah is, uh, as I just mentioned, she is one of the leading veterinarian scientists of our time. Deborah is uh, a professor at the Cummings School of Veterinarian Science at the Tufts University in uh, the United States. And she is uh, the director of a global project called Stop Spillover, which is focused on preventing uh, the zoonotic disease spillover across the world. We will be hearing more from Deborah in, in a few minutes. Um, our next panelist of the day is Nadia Rimi, uh, who is also a scientist. And uh, Nadia is from Bangladesh. Uh, Nadia is associated with uh, the Center, International Center for Diarrheal Research. Mm, uh, or in short, it is uh, called ICDDRB. And uh, finally, we have with us uh, Musa Sangari, uh, who is a health communication expert from Inner News. Uh, Musa uh, has years of experience uh, of uh, you know working on uh, communicable diseases, resilience, government, science, and health communications. So uh, without any more delay, because we have uh, already 
you know, it's, it's been 10 minutes already. So I will be uh, going to Deborah first. Our format today is that uh, I will be asking uh, uh, one or two questions to our panelists, and then uh, our panelists will be sharing their presentations in their answer. And as I mentioned right in the beginning, you will have your chance to ask some questions as well in the end. So, Deborah, let me begin with you. Um, you know, uh, March 11, 2020, we stepped into the pandemic, and here we are in September. And uh, uh, we are still living in one pandemic, and we often hear that, you know, this, could, this, this probably isn't the last pandemic we have seen. So, keeping that as a backdrop, you know, what are the best ways to prevent the next pandemic? And how can governments adapt to those ways? And uh, if you don't mind taking yet another question, because since you are leading this uh, Stop Spillover project, uh, what role does Stop Spillover project aim to play in that? Deborah. Thank you so much, Thank Stella. You. Uh, for that introduction, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today with all of you. Um, I think that what you do is so important, and it's actually a centerpiece of the Stop Spillover Project because we think communication, especially about risk, risk in people's daily lives, is just critical. And so, so first and foremost, thank you for joining today, and, and I hope you can be ambassadors with your colleagues about the importance of reporting on science and specifically the importance of understanding some about, some about the details of how spillover occurs. So I, I'd like to make a few points that I think address Stella's questions. Um, first of all, it, it's, it's really important that we be prepared for pandemics. And, and we talk a lot about vaccinations and, and preparedness. It is at least, if not way more important that we prevent pandemics. And so the very best way to prevent especially a viral zoonotic pandemic is to prevent spillover. So we're gonna be talking about how, how we might do that. Um, a central piece of that discussion will be about the spillover ecosystem. The idea that we have, uh, we have in our mind uh, a, a way to, um, to think about spillover that, that keeps us thinking about all the dimensions of it. So we'll talk more about that. The second piece is that we also think it's very important as we, as we approach prevention, to think about One Health as a mindset that we bring to that discussion. And, and just a, a quick definition of One Health, the idea that there is no dividing line between human, animal, and environmental health. And our ability to understand threats like pandemics is very much tied up with our understanding of the interfaces across those three sectors. And then finally, uh, the notion that we don't know everything, that we must invest in research, we must be able to fill some of the gaps that we have in understanding the spillover ecosystem in order to be able to design interventions that ultimately, again, we hope will prevent pandemics. So I'd like to uh, share my screen for just a moment. And... All right, there we go. Uh, and it's at the wrong end of the, sorry about that, wrong end of the presentation. So as Nadia, sorry, as Stella mentioned, um, my role right now is tied up with uh, strategies to prevent spillover. So I'm directing a, a global project that includes 14 partners uh, stretched around the world and uh, including uh, key, key areas uh, in Africa and Asia in which spillover risk is the highest. And so, again, our central concept that I mentioned um, is this notion of a spillover ecosystem. And so I just want to spend a few minutes walking through this diagram. And, and as I do it, I really want each of you to think about where you are in that diagram. Are you a member of uh, one of the stakeholder groups that is at high risk? If you are in your daily life, what spillover opportunities do you see? So, so be thinking very personally about this diagram. So on the, on the outer edge, we're really trying to uh, show you factors that impact spillover. And some of these won't be surprising to you. And like, uh, for example, environmental factors, climate change, deforestation, habitat fragmentation. 
um, expanding agriculture and land use that encroaches upon forests. Uh, the notion that that happens sometimes because of food insecurity, of people needing to seek uh, or sustain food sources. Uh, the idea of um, urbanization and, and growing cities and growing populations and shrinking habitats for wildlife. Certainly ecology of viruses. How do we understand that they move from animals to people? The two that I wanna sort of call out um, particularly though are ones that you can again, think very personally about. What are the gender and cultural factors that impact uh, the likelihood of spillover, the risk of spillover? And what are the behavior, uh, behaviors that we exhibit that either make spillover more likely or less likely, and certainly once a pandemic occurs, uh, that may dictate how well we can manage it. So think about all of these factors, and, and we're gonna come back to some of those as we walk through the rest of the diagram. So, so what happens, who do these factors impinge upon? Well, they impinge upon stakeholders. And so the remaining, um, the, the green ring here is, is sort of the general sense of who are groups of stakeholders. And just as we walked through before, we talked about um, livestock, the value chain in livestock and how that is uh, related to risk factors wildlife trade and the notion that certainly that is related to uh, a couple of different factors that we said were important in spillover, uh, urbanization and uh, defragmentation of habitats. Um, it's also the case that extractive industries like mining where individuals are in close association with forests and with uh, areas where wildlife live and um, can be uh, a source of exposure. Others that you may not immediately think of are folks who work in research and academic institutions. Certainly our healthcare workers are on this wheel. Our government ministries, people working uh, in, in the ministries to, to try to manage health of animals and of people. Um, we also have national One Health platforms that we think are very important here in terms of uh, potential stakeholders and how we manage the spillover ecosystem. As you move into the light blue ring, then, then now you see uh, what are our high risk interfaces? Where are spillovers most likely to occur? And we've really already mentioned these. Some may surprise you though, in addition to wildlife habitats and farms and markets, uh, really healthcare and meat processing plants, places where workers are uh, in association with either patients or animals that are infected where viruses can move. And so then finally, the last part of this diagram, these are our high risk stakeholders. So where do you fit there? Are, are you a consumer? Probably you are. Uh, you may work in an industry that is at high risk, or you may be a scientist or a farmer, or you may be in one of the more um, non-traditional uh, industries. And, and part of what we like to do is to be sure and bring all those stakeholders to the table so we can understand their spillover ecosystem. So, so if you don't remember anything else from what I say, I, I want you to remember and think about this diagram about the factors, about the groups of stakeholders, about the interfaces where they uh, are in association, and finally about that, that individual, that individual stakeholder in the middle. And so as you write and think about, um, about spillover, think about all the ways that the lines in between these cells are key areas for, for better understanding. So um, I just wanted to mention, um, I'll kind of mention as I go along where the project Stop Spillover is. And so we are working in the microcosm of the spillover ecosystem, but we are working in the countries that are listed on the left there. So uh, year one, Uganda, Liberia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and then West African countries in year two. These are places that were deemed to be at high risk for spillover. And so, um, so I guess um, to, to Nadia's, to not, not Nadia, to Stella's first question about, um, so, so why is it so important to prevent, um, to think about prevention? And that spillover ecosystem, I think, is, is the answer to that. So how do you go about that? Well, uh, let's use the Stop Spillover Project as a bit of a framework for thinking about that. So in the framework of that project, we have three objectives. And you'll notice in all of them, uh, the phrase strengthen country capacity leads the statement. So that's a key feature because it doesn't really matter if we understand spillover. It, that, that understanding and that ability to intervene needs to percolate down to or, or across to all members of society and all of these different stakeholder groups. So objective one is, uh, is to strengthen country capacity to monitor, analyze, and characterize risk. 
So you'll see the term risk across the things that I talk about for our project. It's vital that all of our stakeholders understand risk, what it is, um, and how to analyze it, how to communicate it, and that's where you guys come in, right? Really important that we communicate it effectively. And then finally, how to decrease it. Um, objective two is, again, strengthening capacity, but now to develop, test, and implement interventions that will reduce the risk of spillover at those interfaces that we just talked about in the spillover ecosystem. And so this is a, a big piece of our project. Objective three, in the unfortunate circumstance that spillover occurs, then we're also interested in strengthening capacity to mitigate amplification and spread of, of these priority zoonotic viral diseases, especially as it relates to humans. So those are all areas where, um, where we can think about advancing prevention. I wanna just briefly comment on our, our consortium. And the reason is not so much necessarily to think that you're gonna remember all these names, but to say, you know, I hope your impression as you look at that screen is of that's a lot of organizations. And I, and I think we need to keep that in mind that it takes, it takes uh, a consortium, it takes a, a willingness to reach across different sectors to do the best job of preventing spillover. And so our implementing partners, uh, Afrohun, Siahun, and ICDDRB are all institutions. Um, the Afrohun and Siahun are One Health University networks. And so a lot of universities and their graduates go out and understand One Health and help understand things like spillover. ICDDRB, a research institute, uh, a place where we think about these questions in terms of, say, viral, viral ecology. Um, we have some private sector partners. Right Track Africa is an outcome mapping uh, partner, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, JSI and Tetra Tech, two big private sector international development groups, and then a host of universities, University of Washington, UCLA, University of Glasgow, and the University of Nebraska. And really the Broad Institute is also an academic uh, institution that sits between MIT and Harvard. All of these folks have uh, researchers and faculty members who can delve into different areas of spillover with their expertise and support it. And then of course, HOT. Uh, and Internews, we're very thankful to Internews for being a partner on our consortium to help us get the word out, especially in uh, populations that are at greatest risk. And HOT helps us uh, in terms of really GIS localization of where we work and where spillover is most likely to occur. So just very quickly, what does it look like to tackle this problem of spillover? Well, this is just a very kind of schematic diagram for what happened in year one in our project. Well, first of all, we, we hired country teams, all of whom were in country. These are folks who live and breathe every day the environment that we're trying to understand. Engaging stakeholders at the national, regional, and local levels. It's not sufficient to do it at the national level. It has to be all the way down to folks who live, uh, again, in, in communities and are at risk. Uh, creating in-depth reports of trying to understand uh, circumstances on the ground. And then really importantly, conducting an outcome mapping exercise where we put the stakeholder in the driver's seat and say, now you tell us what outcomes you want from our efforts to, to uh, prevent spillover. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. That outcome mapping then yields um, a roadmap for us to identify our gaps in knowledge. And then finally, to design and assess interventions, which is, of course, our, our preferred outcome or our required outcome from the project. Just a few quick comments about outcome mapping. Uh, it is a participatory tool. It's very collaborative. Importantly, traditional and non-traditional spillover ecosystem stakeholders are engaged in this. It focuses, don't, not only focuses on people, it really, again, puts them as the drivers of change. We think that's so important to be able to map their outcomes, to think about critical partners that they work with every day, and to design lasting, sustainable interventions. Um, the last bullet may be the most important, and it goes back to our spillover ecosystem in terms of um, focusing on behavior changes, relationships across individuals and groups, uh, gender. Gender is really important when we think about what jobs do women do, what jobs do men do that put them at increased risk. So just a brief word um, as we think about spillover, uh, and this goes back to how do we manage prevention? Um, we can't boil the ocean, right? We need to focus on the highest, highest priority pathogens that are likely to, or that we know have already caused problems. And so here's a few that are listed. We won't get into those in detail, but you'll recognize them. Viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, 
zoonotic influenza viruses, certainly in, in uh, Southeast Asia and Asia, animal origin coronaviruses, COVID-19, SARS and MERS, those are all familiar. And then finally, Nipah and Lassa fever, Nipah more in, again in Asia and Lassa fever more in West Africa. All of these are the specific targets for our project because they're priority viral zoonotic pathogens. They're not the only pathogens, but they're ones of great importance. So I'll, I'll sort of wrap up here by, by talking briefly about how do we go at preventing spillover or under, first understanding and then preventing. And so these are illustrative interfaces. I've picked Liberia as a country that we'll be working in. They have a lot of uh, trouble with loss of fever. And so that is a human rodent interface. Uh, the pathogen is lo loss of fever. And the, and the problem is rodent invasion into homes, into areas where people work. Um, so how do we intervene in that? So we'll start with outcome mapping. We'll talk to stakeholders and, and ask them to think about that. And then we will go back and design interventions uh, that we hope can be sustainable and effective. Um, I'm going to skip unofficial points of entry and, and touch base on wildlife handling. This is going to be important in all of the countries we work in and is important uh, globally in terms of uh, prevention of spillover. And we talk about deforestation, the need to preserve species, the need to preserve habitats. And so that's important in a number of pathogens. We've picked Ebola here. Um, and the idea that we need to understand the wildlife value chain, both legal and illegal, and, and how at the level, again, of stakeholders, how can we intervene in that, in that value chain and still allow people to sustain their livelihood? So I'm going to skip over these. These may come up in the Q&A. Just a very brief mention that many of you have heard about the global health security agenda. This is a major global effort by multiple countries to work together on um, I'm trying to solve some of these important threats. Uh, we very much articulate with uh, the indicators that are important for global health security agenda, and that means cooperation. So I, I say that as, uh, as an important sort of final uh, take home, and that is we aren't doing this on our own. No one should be doing this on their own. They should be collaborating and working across institutions, One Health institutions, but also global health institutions to try to, to, try to, to do better, to try to prevent uh, more frequently to decrease the risk of spillover. So what have we talked about? We've talked about focusing on how to prevent viral spillover from animals to humans. We certainly believe preparedness is essential, but prevention is absolutely the key and it's a lot cheaper in the long run. Uh, a One Health mindset is really required to understand that spillover ecosystem because there's so many interfaces that involve not only humans, but animals and the environment. And that's the only way to design effective interventions. And then finally, there's a lot we don't know. And so we must invest in research to fill the gaps in our knowledge and to hopefully prevent the next pandemic. So thank you so much for your attention. And I, I, I very much look forward to, uh, to talking with you in the Q&A. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, the questions are already trickling in and uh, uh, so are you know, our attendees who are, we are still seeing the number going up. Please, people, please uh, keep posting, keep posting your questions and we will get those answers to you. Even if we can't cover them all during this webinar, we certainly will do it afterwards. Um, so yes, Debbie, we, I will come back to you, uh, especially with some questions. Um, right now, uh, one thing that Debbie mentioned is that the project is, the project is working, the project is working in countries that are considered uh, prioritized and countries that where uh, the spillover is most likely to occur. And so our uh, list of diseases that she shared, which are uh, the most important ones to look at right now. And one of them, this diseases, this pathogens is the Nipah virus. And in Bangladesh, um, uh, Nadia, if I understand uh, in Bangladesh, uh, the project uh, Stop Spillover is focusing especially at uh, Nipah virus. So, so could you uh, tell us, you know, what, what are the main drivers of Nipah virus in Bangladesh? And uh, how is the Stop Spillover project aiming uh, to prevent this virus spillover? Over to you, Nadia. Thanks, Dela, and uh, hello and good day to all. Uh, 
if you allow me, am I, I don't have a very good internet, so I'm not turning uh, on my video. So to answer your question, uh, if you allow me, I'll share my screen. Sure, go sure. ahead. Yeah. So can you see this? Can you see my slide, Stella? Yes, we can see your slide. Okay, thank you. So, so I'll uh, begin uh, my presentation uh, on uh, Nipah virus spillover ecology in Bangladesh. So, uh, Nipah is a viral zoonotic disease uh, and the natural uh, reservoirs for Nipah virus are teropus fruit bats, which are found in Eastern Africa uh, and throughout Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. In September 1998, uh, the first outbreak of Nipah started in pigs and pig farmers at the village Sungai Nipah in Malaysia, after which the virus was named. Almost all patients had contact with uh, sick pigs and pig meat. And outbreaks have been reported in five countries so far, which are Malaysia, Singapore, India, Bangladesh, and Philippines. So, uh, so far, more than 700 cases have been reported globally, with a case fatality around 58%. And Bangladesh contributed to the majority of the NEPA human cases. Uh, till August 2021, a total of 322 cases of NEPA infection were recognized uh, with a very high mortality rate. Bangladesh detected a total of uh, 38 outbreaks uh, uh, in 32 of the six districts. Uh, as shown in the map, Nipah virus uh, outbreaks are especially clustered within districts in the central and uh, northwest uh, regions of Bangladesh, which is known as Nipah Belt here. And uh, with a few exceptions, Nipah virus spillovers have been observed every year in winter since 2001. Transmission in Bangladesh occurred uh, from bats to humans and person to person uh, and is associated mostly with raw date concept consumption. Existing evidences suggested uh, two possible uh, transmissions. So one is from bat uh, and uh, from person to person. If we focus our discussion on spillover from bats, uh, the roots include sharing food resources, including drinking raw date palm sap, fermented sap, and fruits partially eaten by bats, hunting bats for human consumption, and living nearby and under bat roosts. Uh, during different outbreaks since 2001, uh, consumption of date palm sap has been repeatedly identified as a risk factor. And a fermented sap was also found in two outbreaks. Uh, however, no outbreak has been linked with bat hunting, bat consumption, or partially eaten fruit so far. Now let's look in deeper into the date palm sap because most of you may not be familiar with this. So date palm sap is a sweet drink harvested during uh, November to uh, March, April in Bangladesh. A tap is cut into the tree and a clay pot is placed under the tap in the evening. Uh, the pot is then removed in the following morning each day and raw sap is sold fresh early in, in the morning. And drinking date palm sap in winter is a delicacy in this country. A large proportion of sap is also used to produce molasses. And sap is also sometimes fermented and consumed as alcoholic drink, locally known as tari. Bats visit date palm trees to consume sap by a leak, leaking uh, the shaved area of the tree, urinating and defecating in the collection pots, or becoming trapped and dying in the pot, as you can see in this picture. And uh, infected bats shed virus through saliva, urine, and feces. Now let's look into the factors that might have driven bat behavior to this point. 
Clifton Mackey and colleagues showed that a shift in uh, bat roosting behavior occurred over hundreds of years due to anthropog uh, anthropogenic land use, such as deforestation and urbanization. Teropus bats uh, now live in mostly small roosts in close proximity to humans and opportunistically feed on cultivated food resources. Climate is affecting uh, factors in the system as well. For example, fewer fruits are available during winter uh, than other seasons. So bats may gravitate towards date palms uh, during their food scarcity. And these gradual but dramatic changes have produced a system that facilitates spillover of a bat bone virus. Despite the widespread distribution of bat roost uh, sites all over the country, most roosts are aware decreasing in size and roosts were abandoned uh, and uh, the reasons of bats leaving a roost site included cutting down roost trees, uh, particularly after nip outbreaks, hunting bats or harassing bats away from the roots. Uh, now we need to understand why uh, bat conservation is important. Uh, Bangladesh is home to at least uh, 33 bat species. And the largest and most commonly seen uh, is big Indian flying fox, Teropus gigantus, a fruit eating bat that roosts in uh, tall trees and the hero of this presentation. Uh, bat contributes uh, to restoring the environment ecologically and economically. Uh, although the fruit bats cause occasional damage to fruits, they are largely responsible for the cross-pollination and seed dispersal of uh, wild plants and control insect pests that damage crops. But they are also the reservoirs of uh, several infectious diseases that can affect uh, both humans and animals. Let's see what approaches can be a win-win for both disease and conser uh, uh, conservation uh, perspectives. To prevent NIPA spillover from bats through date pump sap, ICTDRB scientists have been uh, working with IDCR, a government uh, organization, and development partners on developing context appropriate interventions since 2007. And uh, they identified locally used method BANA, which is a scarf like barrier, as you can see in this picture, uh, which is a scarf like barrier to cover the uh, shaved part of the tree so that the bats cannot access uh, the sap. A large community-based randomized trial was implemented with two behavior change communication messages, do not drink raw sap and drink only safe sap. Drinking raw date palm sap is deeply rooted in Bengali culture, therefore eliminating this practice could be really difficult. Uh, however, even if we are unable to eliminate sap consumption, modest reductions in consumption of uh, contaminated date palm sap could meaningfully reduce the risk of transmission. Now I'm going to share a video clip that describes the story of NIPA transmission through date palm sap consumption and prevention using the SCAR. It is in Bengali, but you can see the subtitle in English. Hey, ঢাকার <laughs> <laughs> বানায় ঢাকা খেজুরের রস কাঁচা খাওয়া যায় বানায় ঢাকা রস মানে খেজুর গাছের রস ধরার সময় গাছের কাটা অংশ আর হাড়ি বানা দিয়ে ভালোভাবে ঢেকে রাখতে হয় যাতে রসে বাদুর বসতে না পারে বানায় ঢাকা রস থাকে নিরাপদ এই দেখেন এটা কয় বানায় ঢাকা রস নাও তুমি খালি একটা গাছে বানা লাগাইছো কেন কাঁচা রস তো আপনি এক হাড়ির বেশি খান না রস সিদ্ধ কইরা
খেজুরের রসে বাদুরে সে মুখ দেয় এ রস কাঁচা খেলে তা থেকে মারাত্মক নিপারক হতে পারে এবং পরিবার ও প্রতিবেশীদের মধ্যে তা ছড়াতে পারে জিজ্ঞেস করবা তার রস বানায় ঢাকা রস কিনা মানে নিরাপদ রস কিনা বুঝছ এই যে তোমার রস কি বানায় ঢাকা রস নিপা থেকে বাঁচতে চান খেজুরের কাঁচা রস খাওয়া ভুলে যান তবুও যারা খেতে চান বানায় ঢাকা রসই খান আই होप यू कुड हियर द वीडियो एंड सी एंड हियर द वीडियो क्लियरली सो अ बांग्लादेश गवर्नमेंट हैज कम अप विद ओनली वन मैसेज इन 2012 व्हिच इज डू नॉट ड्रिंक रॉ डेड पम सैप other methods that limit human uh, bad conduct uh, through ecology uh, ecological interventions may also be uh, beneficial uh, plantation of fruit and nectar producing tree species could provide alternative food uh, for terocos bats these may draw bats away from date palm sap harvesting sites and human occupied areas although found to be effective as a short term intervention the scarves must be used consistently and correctly throughout the collection season to be effective and thus uh, the promotion of scarves should uh, also must be continued uh, throughout the season further work can be undertaken to uh, assess the use of uh, effectiveness of scarves to bring in sustainable change in behavior and ensure better protection uh, stop spillover uh, actually introduced uh, outcome mapping in bangladesh which provides a unique platform to integrate uh, all the national and uh, local level stakeholders uh, from uh, different sectors to brainstorm on these approaches recognizing their strengths uh, and limitations their desired change and how to work collaboratively uh, to bring it about i think uh, the professor kochava has already covered uh, a lot on stop spillover so i will not uh, uh, linger it more uh, thank you so much for your patience here thanks over to you uh, stella thank you thank you nadia i must say uh, as a journalist myself that video was uh, what really drive drove home uh, the message for me and it was really great to you know actually it's like presenting a slice of the community life um in in a short video so thank you for especially for that uh, you're welcome we... uh, sorry i uh, took the floor again um, i just forgot to show my acknowledgement slide so that it's for just that so for a few seconds thanks thanks a lot that is fine that's fine uh i'm glad you took that minute <laughs> uh and uh, we do have uh i see some uh, uh, people are uh, uh, posting very interesting questions in the chat box um um uh, please uh, re i request you all to just maybe you can just copy paste the the question in the q and a feature and uh, yeah we will make sure as i promised you will get the answer to your question so please keep posting but do use the q and a section uh and now uh i would like to invite our uh our final panelist of the day musa uh musa uh, i know you are having you are actually uh in the in the field in the eastern part of congo uh and uh you are having you know a lot of technical issues but i hope that you can uh still be able to share with us you know uh, uh telling us you know like how is it what what are the challenges and what are the important things that journalists actually can remember you know even when they are facing a lot of challenges on the ground when they are especially trying to report uh, a zoonotic disease spillover uh, from the ground zero uh, what are the things that 
should not be forgotten, even though there are challenges all around. Musa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, I'm uh, Stella. I'm, um, I'm incredibly honored um, uh, to be in the midst of um, uh, two powerful women, two powerful scientists for sharing their experiences, um, uh, which for me um, uh, is a humbling um, uh, um, uh, opportunity um, uh, to also speak to journalists and to give them some practical ideas in terms of um, uh, responding to, to zoonotic um, uh, disease outbreak. And uh, um, uh, Deborah spoke quite a lot about preparedness and prevention. So my own engagement with journalists is mostly centered around um, uh, um, uh, responding to disease outbreak. So it's a question of um, uh, where preparedness fails and um, uh, prevention mechanisms also fail, which we've seen um, uh, in, in most cases. You know, how do journalists respond to real time situations, you know, when they are faced with, with an outbreak? I mean, whether it's, for example, COVID-19 or Ebola or Marburg, for example. So um, uh, I will share my screen. Um, um, so like Stella said, I'm out in the field. So I have a bit of internet connectivity and, uh, and some challenges um, uh, for you to, to see me and um, I don't know if you guys can see my slide. Yes, Musa, we see it very well. Okay, excellent. Um, um, so I don't have um, uh, much slides um, uh, because I really want to keep this presentation a bit interactive and uh, to also make it um, 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 uh, an experience sharing opportunity based on what we've been doing here in DRC because I've been part of um, uh, internet response to the Ebola outbreak in Eastern DRC and also Western DRC. And I really want to speak to you, the journalist, because I know you have a critical role to play in terms of risk communication. But I would like to respond um, uh, to the question that Stella posed um, uh, from two perspectives. Um, uh, one from the perspective of fear and the other from trust in terms of disease outbreak and the role of journalists in this. So I will start off with fear. Um, uh, when there is a zoonotic disease outbreak, I mean, like Ebola, for example, fear normally become the early victim. I mean, this is something that we've seen, you know, even with COVID-19 and also with our experience I mean, I mean, responding to, to Ebola. There will always be fear of catching the virus, you know, fear of infecting loved ones and, uh, and, uh, and of dying of the virus. So this is something that you, you normally feel it becomes palpable among the population. So as a journalist, I mean, your primary responsibility in this situation is to save lives because that should be the role of a journalist. And most importantly, try not to be part of the problem because otherwise you could also be caught up in the problem whilst you think that you are more or less like I'm mean, providing information to audiences that you could find useful in terms of saving lives. But what is really the problem here? Because I really want to speak based on experience you know, and some of the things that we've observed and how are journalists or the media caught in this, you know? And uh, from our experience here, I mean, while the population could have a good reason to be afraid, as we all do, you know, in disease outbreak, fear most times could be feared by the media itself. You know, their coverage of the epidemic and their program, I mean, sometimes feeding the public with confusing, and in some cases, dreadful information about the virus. Like for example, in the situation of Ebola, you know, we had quite a lot of information around Ebola kills, you know, you will die if you catch the virus, there is no cure for Ebola, you know, without creating any room for, for, for nuances, you know, in how this information is disseminated to the public. And another issue as well, which journalists should be aware of, there is also the urge from some sections of the media for, for breaking news stories you know, with focus on statistics of death. You know, some even go to the extent of paint, painting a green, I'm a, I'm a dreadful picture of how, for example, in the case of Ebola, you bleed to death, you know, I mean, providing this kind of dreadful scenario, you know, to the public. I mean, while, while in some cases, I mean, it's not a journalist, because I don't want to blame all of this on the, on the journalist. 
I mean, are not the authors of some of these hearings and information. They make their platforms, in some cases, readily available to other actors to spread it and thereby amplifying the, the, the information to a larger section of the population. So that's where journalists normally come in. You know? So you have to be very conscious in terms of how you use your platform, which is a very powerful tool in terms of engaging audiences in disease outbreak. So it's easier for the media to cut up in this. So for, for me, I've been thinking, you know, in terms of why I mean, we have all these hearings in, you know, this fear mongering, you know, messages or information that people normally give out when, when, when there, is, there is a disease outbreak. You know, I don't know whether, for example, this is meant to shock the population into acting, but if definitely people don't have the right information to protect themselves, I mean, the information, I mean, to, to, to seek services, for example, in some cases, they don't even know what to do, and they are confused, they are scared, and at times they are completely lost. There will normally be a natural impulse for people to do something that is completely bizarre. You know, so you have to think about the impact that fear will have on the population and the role that media can play, you know, either in amplifying or more or less play a very positive role in terms of I mean, I mean, reassuring communities, in terms of providing the right information to communities. So let, let, me, let me just give a practical example because I know there are audiences or journalists from Liberia, you know, because we, we all experienced the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in, in 2014, I mean, Sierra Leone and, and Guinea as well. I mean, so there was a moment at the start of the Ebola outbreak, I mean, when rumors went around that people should wake up in the middle of the night to drink hot water mixed with salt because they thought that could protect them. And a lot of people did, you know, and they believed what they were doing, like, like it was the right thing to protect them. You know, so this, this pointed to the early information disseminated about the virus, which generated quite a lot of fear, you know, to the extent that some people ended up doing something very, very bizarre, and also which I could consider to be ridiculous. You know, and you can imagine how this singular action of drinking hot water mixed with salt created a false sense of protection among the population. Because people are so afraid, you know, based on all the information that they've been getting from the media, whether from radio or from other sources, you know, that you can bleed to death, you know, Ebola is this, you know, so people could just hang on to anything that they could find as a means of protecting themselves. You know, so as a journalist, your cardinal role is to provide accurate, timely, relevant, and actionable information to audiences and the affected population. But what does it mean in practical terms? Because this could be, for example, a very big word that I'm trying to put across to journalists, but it makes sense for us to look at it. What does it mean? Like in terms of, I mean, practical terms, in terms of the programs that you produce. So in the first place, when we talk about I mean, information that is clear, we are talking about information that is devoid of jargons and disseminated in the language that people can understand. Because if you want to communicate with with people, especially communities, rural communities, marginalized groups, you have to understand, you know, the limitations of some of those community people. Do you really want to speak to them in English, for example, or in French? You know, we are, for example, by using local language, you know, could just do the trick and get your message across, you know, to those people. There is also this important aspect of how you translate some technical words so your audience can easily understand what you are saying. Because there are some words, for example, in science, you have to find a way for you to explain to the audience for them to understand. You know, like for some of us, for example, as a result of our experience with outbreaks, you know, we came um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, in contact with words like, for example, quarantine, lockdowns, you know, these are words that local people could not easily understand. You know, so you have to find a way for you to explain to them for them to understand some of these words in as much as you are providing life-saving information to them. You know, so that's, that's one aspect. Information has to be very clear. Then the other aspect is think, at, think about information that, that, that people can act on. Don't just give information for the sake of giving it, but information that people can assimilate and can be able to act on, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a question of, for example, what will I do, for example, if I fall ill as an individual? You know, what sort of steps, for example, could I take to keep myself and my family protected? So if there's an Ebola outbreak, it's important not just to give them the information in terms of how the virus spreads, but also give them practical information that if they suspect somebody in their family that has fallen ill 
or is showing some symptoms of Ebola, they could do X, Y, Z. So that's the way you're able to provide life-saving information you know, to the population and also to audiences. And it's also important for us to give out information about available services because people are lost in some cases, they do not know what is happening. You know, if there are treatment centers, you know, if there are emergency lines, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a certain ambulance services, these are information that you can make available in your engagement in the information that you share out to audiences because this could be life-saving for some communities as well and how they could access you know, some of those services as well. And, uh, and I think the, the third aspect also, you have to think about information that inspires hope. You know, it's not just about giving information that, that is green, giving information that could shock, because some people say they do I mean, provide some of those fear mongering information because they want to shock the population into action. But for me, there is no pleasure in adding to the pain of a population that is facing a deadly epidemic, in most cases, they lack basic services because I'm talking about practical experience in some communities where you do not have even hospitals, for example, there are no ambulance services. And some of these community people are entrenched in chronic poverty, you know, and in some cases they are visibly traumatized. You know, so without information of hope that they can survive the virus, if they do X, Y, Z, for example, you only push them to the margins of life. So as journalists, you have to think about this, the impact that some of this information will have on communities and ordinary people. And that could force people to cling on to anything that this similar thing can protect them, you know, or possibly they might just be left I mean, I mean, I mean, to resign to death, you know. So for me, it's, 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 it's important as journalists for us to consider, you know, how we communicate with audiences, how we communicate with communities, the type of information that we put out to them, you know, that could I mean, be, be, be life-saving. You know, and while we may have bombarded the population, for example, with information about that, you know, and um, for us, for example, like, like in DRC, some of the things that we find very useful was how we are able to use survival stories, you know, as a story of hope, you know, that we thought was very inspiring, you know, because you had people who had survived the virus, you know, who could be able to share that, their experience, and that could more or less like inspire some community people to say, okay, there is a possibility that I can beat this virus if I go to a treatment center early and get treatment, and if I do X, Y, Z based on the information that I'm getting, you know. And this is something that journalists could also integrate into their program, you know, because it could help not just to inspire hope, but could also address a fundamental problem that we also observed here in DRC. We are at certain stage of the epidemic, people started even questioning the existence of the virus. Because in some cases, people could overcome their fears, you know, after some time, either because if they've got quite a lot of information or because over time people get, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fine ways in terms of I mean, cohabiting with the virus, so they could overcome their fears and they could start even questioning whether this virus exists. So some of those survival stories could also remind people that yes, the virus exists, we have people who have, who have contracted a virus. It's not just about those who have died. And you could be able to save yourself and your family if you do X, Y, Z, you know? But again, as a journalist, you can only give what you have, you know? So if you don't have the relevant information, it becomes much more difficult for you to engage your audience, you know? So in some cases, you may have the information, but possibly you don't even know how to use it. You may have the information about what you're supposed to do. and. Uh, in other cases, you may even have the wrong information and you are giving out wrong information to audiences based on I mean, your sources of information you know, and the people that you speak to. You know, so this for me raises several questions you know, in terms of how journalists do their work and how they respond to epidemics. You know? So some fundamental questions that I really want to put out to journalists for them to think about in terms of the work that they do. The first thing is, I mean, what is your knowledge about the disease? You know, whether it's Ebola, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's Marburg, for example, what is your knowledge as a journalist? Because you have a responsibility for you, for you to do some research. You know, what do you know, know about, the, about the virus? You know, how does this spread? What are the protective measures? These are fundamental things that you expect journalists to have some knowledge about, not just to help them in terms of their program, but also in terms of even protecting themselves. Because the last thing that you want to do as a journalist is for you to be the story, rather you reporting the story. Because if you get infected, then probably the spotlight turns on you, the journalist, that the journalist has been infected and possibly died of the virus. So you really want to protect yourself you know, by having this level of information and also to help you in terms of how you do your program. 
And it's also important for you as a journalist to know what are the services that are available to respond to the outbreak. You know, whether these services are at, at, at national level, whether they have them at local level, whether you have certain res response structures that have been set up, what are the various pillars? Because the media is just one component as part of the risk communication in terms of engaging audiences. And which for me, I consider to be the most important. You also have other components as well, you know, which deals with I mean, quite a lot of I mean, other stuff in terms of, in terms of I mean, I mean, disease outbreak response. But you need to know all these components on all these structures, whether at national level or at local level, because it helps you for you to know exactly where you have to turn to and who do you speak to in terms of getting information that you need. You know, and it's also important for you to ask yourself the question, where do you get your information for your program? Whether it's a radio program or it's an online content. I mean, is it from a credible source? You know, do you just get information online from any, any other source or do you get it from sources that you think are certified? Otherwise, otherwise you can also contribute I mean, to misinformation and you can also contribute to, to, to creating fears you know, among, among our communities and among the population as well. And uh, another aspect again is um, what are the Musa, concerns? Musa, the Musa, we, we are now, we, <laughs> we are kind of running short on time. Uh, we have questions to answer. So I'll give you one more minute <laughs> to, yes. to wrap so it up. Let me, let me, yeah, let me just wrap it up. You know, some few questions. You know, so one of the things as well is, I mean, are you engaging your communities? You know, what are their concerns? You know, and uh, are you listening to them? Because these are the things that you have to integrate into your program. And finally, I mean, who are your experts that you are bringing on board for them to unpack some of these complex issues in relation to the outbreak? I mean, are these people that are trustworthy, you know, based on community perception? Because you could bring somebody who's an expert, but possibly that person is not trustworthy in the eyes of the community and could not do you much good in terms of the program that you produce. So, so for me, I mean, final point is, these are important questions for journalists to think about and for your work to have an impact. And I think these are issues that must be integral to what you do in covering um, a zoonotic disease outbreak. So that's it for me, I mean, for, for this part as well. Thank you, Musa. So many, uh, I can already see, so you shared your take home messages. But I think the most important one that jumped out uh, at me was, you know, that journalists have an uphill task of, you know, sharing correct information, uh, you know, at the same time, keeping home alive, keeping hope alive. Uh, in, in no way that is, you know, a small challenge. Uh, we have, thank you, panelists. Um, uh, I did, uh, I, I, I promise that I still want to get, you know, if you uh, have one, you know, core take home message, I think uh, Musa has already shared some really good messages to remember. And so has Debbie, so it leaves out Nadia. And I will now come to Nadia straight to you. Uh, would you uh, like to share, you know, uh, at least, you know, one or two uh, messages that you want us to take home and, you know, remember them? Thanks, Stella, for the opportunity. I'll be very short uh, in delivering my message this time. I'll take two minutes. So an emerging uh, lethal zoonotic pathogen like Nipah that has crossed the species barrier several times and uh, can be transmitted from one person to another are particularly concerning because they could evolve to become a more highly transmissible and cause large outbreak, uh, outbreaks or pandemics. And Bangladesh is uh, the only place where spillover events are predictably identified each year. And findings from Bangladesh persuaded uh, WHO to include Nipah virus as one of the pandemic potential priority pathogens and uh, in the research and development group blueprint. Therefore, preventing bad to human transmission to, of Nipah virus should be a global, uh, global health priority. And while doing so, we need to be highly cautious that we do not cause further damage to the bat population since it plays an important role in maintaining the ecological balance. Instead, we can take this opportunity to compensate some of the damages that we have already caused to bat population through deploying ecological approaches. And uh, we also need to be mindful about stigmatizing or harming people who rely on bats or date pumps app for their living. 
Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nadia. I know uh, you have, you know, uh, probably an urgent meeting where you have to go, but we can't just let you go without answering a question or two. And we have a question uh, from Peru, uh, you know, that uh, I would really love to love you to answer. Uh, and the question is, I live in uh, near a beach and uh, there are lots of bats and squirrels uh, in, in, in where I live. Uh, so how do we, uh, how do we keep ourselves safe, uh, you know, from, from the bats? So I think uh, the question indicates, uh, you know, bats being in very close proximity to, to the people uh, in Peru. Thanks, thanks for the question. I think uh, uh, it, to answer on uh, a solution, it's really important to understand the context. I mean, if uh, we talk about Bangladesh, uh, we had it, uh, the, all the solutions that we are proposing, it's, it did not come like in one day or in one year. It has been uh, several years, decades of you know, research uh, and going into the community and trying to understand the ecology, trying to understand the human behavior and bad behavior as well uh, to come up with some solutions. Like for, as the, for example, Bana, the bamboo scar or the scar to prevent, uh, uh, to protect the date pump sap. Uh, for that, we really invested, uh, there were uh, anthropological investigations or exploration in the community to understand the context and behavior, human behavior, bad behavior, and the ecology, climatic factors. And there have been a lot of, so, so with all this, the, uh, with a deeper understanding of the uh, context and uh, all these factors, then you can come up with, generate some evidence and you can establish uh, and come up with a solution. So to uh, be able to you know, answer on what can be suitable for Peru, we really need to understand all these uh, different factors and context in Peru. But there are some generic uh, you know, uh, recommendations that can be applicable to any country that we are uh, probably, and it, this is more uh, context appropriate for Bangladesh, this is a very, you know, uh, densely populated country. So we are uh, really uh, cutting down trees and uh, doing a lot of harm to the bat habitat. So plant tree plantation, ecological interventions like tree, tree plantation, and, you know, trying to not disturb bat habitat and bat food uh, resources. That is something that can be a generic recommendation. So mm. thanks. Thank you. So preserving the, the trees that host bats and restoring the bat habitat is a good way to start. Uh, thank you, uh, Nadia. Uh, we do have quite a few questions, uh, Debbie, uh, and I think you are, you know, uh, the, you can answer them better. Uh, one answer uh, that uh, that I would <laughs> like to just point out, I think, was already answered by by Deb. Uh, Debbie. Right in the beginning, uh, the question is: uh, This project doesn't work in Nepal. Uh, no, the project uh, has identified the most, you know, the, the countries where uh, the zoonotic spillover is most likely to, to occur, and Nepal uh, is, is not one of them. But yes, in, in Asia, uh, the project is in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Bangladesh, as we saw in Deborah's uh, presentations. Um, uh, Debbie, uh, the, the next question uh, that we have is, um, can you share a bit about how the team will measure uh, the prevention of spillover? A good question. Um, we'll have working groups that will um, use what's been learned from outcome mapping, so stakeholder engagement. Um, they will form hypotheses and basically write a, a small study proposal. Um, that proposal will include their methodology, uh, how they would like to ask the question, how they will collect data and how they will analyze that data. And then the recommendations that will come from that uh, will in fact form the next hypothesis. So that's basically the scientific method. And so we're very keen to keep our focus on evidence-based uh, thinking. And so your question about how will you measure prevention in each of those studies that will be proposed, uh, there will be metrics, there will be measurements that are 
relevant and appropriate for that hypothesis. And, and prevention will be important in terms of uh, knowing when, for example, I, I think um, going to Nadia's example, if you, if you were able to over time uh, compare the, the incidence of Nipah virus or, or illness in an area with date palm trees uh, that did not in fact have any safety measures, did not use the skirts and uh, were drinking raw sap that's, that's not been boiled, then what's the incidence of Nipah virus uh, under those circumstances over, over a period of time? Because it would take a while to, to assess this. And then upon implementation of, uh, of an intervention, can you measure a decrease uh, in, in the actual incidence of the disease? Um, so Nadia, you probably have uh, studies that you can quote that suggest uh, if those kinds of data have been able to support the use of tree skirts um, for that particular disease. Mm -hmm. Nadia, um, did you want to comment at all on that? Sorry, I missed part of it. So uh, we're Just, talking, yes. Please. Yeah, the notion that we have a prevention, for example, with Nipah virus, and that at some point, um, the question is, how can you uh, measure prevention of spillover? And my comment was, uh, at an at a environmental epidemiological level, you could measure the incidence of Nipah virus infection in communities that, that did and did not deploy skirts. That would be something that would be a change over time. It's not an immediate change because it's behavior, uh, but do you, do you want to comment as to whether those types of data are available? Yes, uh, so in Bangladesh, we, as, uh, as I mentioned during our uh, mic presentation, that in Bangladesh, we only implemented that intervention for as a short-term intervention, and uh, we evaluated the immediate outcome on the behavior level, whether they're using it or not. So there are two types of, like, you know, impact. So one is whether uh, the intervention worked as, uh, as in, like, uh, uptaking the behavior, the use of SCART, and one is, like, whether there is a reduction in the cases. So, uh, uh, so these two are not uh, really assessed in, in the same way. And the intervention was also not uh, a, you know, tested for a longer time uh, in a sustainable, as a sustainable intervention. So that is what we plan to do in uh, STOPS if uh, that is what the stakeholders want to do as well. So that is what we are doing during our uh, outcome mapping sessions right at this moment, which is going on in Bangladesh. So as a group, if we come up with uh, in a consensus that we want to test and take it this uh, BANA or uh, BAM, uh, the SCART intervention to the next level to uh, you know, implement it as a long-term intervention and see the impact. So that, can, that is what we are aiming at, but we don't have the data as of now, as of today. So again, it's a good question because it's not as simple as it sounds. Uh, it is, it is a, it's challenging and often, often uh, includes behavior change, which is slow and takes a while to measure. But uh, for, I guess the real answer is for every study that we do, there will be metrics and there will be um, a plan for measuring because I think it's really important for the evidence basis. Thank you, thank you, Debbie, uh, for taking on the question. Uh, the next, for the next question, I would like to go to Musa. Uh, Musa, if you can, uh, you know, uh, still hear us. I hope you do. Uh, the the question is interesting, and I'm pretty sure our our other panelists would uh, probably also like to weigh in. So please do feel free. Uh, to jump in. Uh, but first, Musa, if you could uh, begin by telling us, how do we tell poor people not to consume bush meat when there is an Ebola outbreak? Um, uh, this, this is a very interesting question. And uh, at times, it's, it's also a very complex one, because you are also trying to balance um, uh, safety of communities in terms of uh, their very own livelihood. But I will say, this is not just about looking at it from the point of view of community people not eating bush meat, but it's also looking at it from the broader perspective in terms of how do you get community on your side, you know, in terms of engaging them on the, on the, on the virus and on the I mean, outbreak, and in terms of them I mean, picking up some, some positive health-seeking behavior, you know, because otherwise it might be much more challenging if you just focus on bush meat as one aspect, rather than living 
the bigger picture, which I will consider I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, in terms of disease outbreak in building trust with community members. Because once you build trust with community members, then it's easier for them to understand exactly what you are saying because they think you are a little bit empathetic to their concerns. And you are able to understand some of the reasons behind certain behavior and certain attitudes and certain practices. And one of the best ways that we've realized in building trust with communities in addressing issues around bushmeat is how you listen to community concerns, how you engage communities, you know, how you provide a platform for them to express themselves on the core issues that they consider to be fundamental. Some of them could be social, some of them could be cultural, and some of them could be economic. You know, like in the case of Ebola, for example, you know, people have used to wash in dead bodies, you know, and they have these elaborate ceremonies. And with the Ebola outbreak, you start telling people, no, don't touch dead bodies, you know, because I mean, it's risky and you can also contract the virus. Some people cool, but some people may not, you know. So the best way that you can change some of those behaviors, some of those perceptions and those attitudes is how you listen to community concerns, why they are not doing this. If communities are eating bushmeat, you could not just go and say, stop eating bushmeat. You could legislate and pass on all, all, all measures, either from central government or local government, but people could still find ways to eat in it. But once you build trust with community members, you're able to discuss with them, to engage them, to listen to their concerns, and you integrate some of these concerns in the program that you do. In some cases, you may not have all the answers to some of their concerns, but in other cases, as a media, you could be able to link those community members with other response pillars for them to address some of those issues because you create a platform in terms of engaging them. You know, and I think that's one thing that is fundamental, and that's one thing we should be thinking about, you know, as I'm a humanitarian actors, as journalists, you know, as people who are part of the response effort. Don't leave out the communities, don't discount them, don't focus on one aspect, try to look at the bigger picture. And once you build that trust, then it's easier for people to, 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 to understand what you are saying and for you to get a buy-in and the community to come on board and provide community-driven solutions to some of the problems that they are faced with. So they could see the reason why at this time we do not need to eat bush meat because we think it's not good and why we could have some alternative means of even surviving as, as a community and also respect some of these public health measures. I mean, I have, I have lots of examples that I could share in terms of how you build trust, you know, and how this has helped us in our work. But I don't know whether, for example, we'll have time for that. But these are things that I think, for example, journalists I might could find very, very useful, you know, in terms of how community perceive outbreaks. Like a classical example, for example, in, in DRC, you know, we, we, we came to realize we're more or less like trying to find explanations where there we are some debt, for example, at treatment centers based on community perception in relation to the response, I mean, towards Ebola. Because community thought that Ebola was invented to kill them. So they had this perception that even treatment centers that we are set to save them, these treatment centers, we are more or less like death centers. So those who fall sick of Ebola and transfer to treatment centers, it's more or less like taking them to death, center, to, to death centers. You know, so you have, we have somebody who survived the virus who had to recount his story to us regarding two other patients who, because they had this community perception that treatment centers were more or less like death sentences, they refused to eat the food that they are served at those treatment centers while they are even taking their medication. So for each time they were served food by the nurses, they will wait until the nurses, nurses leave, they go and dispose of the food in the toilet because the food, they thought the food was poison and they had this perception that the treatment centers were death centers. So this person who survived, he survived because he thought he had nothing to lose. You know, whether he had to eat the food which was poisoned, possibly he could die or he could survive. So he ended up eating the food and also taking his medication and he ended up surviving. We can't categorically say that because of the food that he ate, I mean, made him to survive or those who did not eat the food possibly, that was the reason why they passed away. But for us, it was an eye opener because it gives us new explanations of the damaging impact of community perception, even with the very best of intentions that we have in terms of I mean, addressing some of those issues, if we don't engage with communities, we don't build trust. You could set up all these I mean, treatment centers, you could have all these wonderful messages, you will not have a buy-in from communities. And I don't know if you will have your work much more difficult in terms of changing behavior and changing perception. Thank you, thank you, Musa. Um, uh, Debbie, uh... Yeah, we are almost actually <laughs> nearing the end of this webinar. But before that, uh, there are questions that um, I, at least two 
quick questions for you. Uh, one is, uh, Debbie, uh, you know, how does stakeholders engage at national and even regional level? I think you do have, you have answered these questions, uh, you know, previously. So, um, you know, still, if you want to uh, add anything, if not, there is one more question. Will stop spillover also develop less specific interventions that we expect will pre prevent spillover of currently unknown threats? Yeah. So, so those are all good questions. And I'm gonna wrap in a third question because it was so intriguing to me about safety theory that was posed. Um, so talked about safety theory, there's a theory one, which is basically you try to prevent accidents, bad things from happening. And safety two is you look at all the things that happen that go well, and you try to uh, capitalize on that behavior to, to decrease risks. And so I think that question points directly to our approach related to stakeholders, that we really are in some ways doing a combination of safety one and safety two. We're asking stakeholders to think about, you know, what is their daily routine? How, how do they navigate? And, and what are the things that really keep them safe? Uh, in addition to what are the things that may increase their risk? So I guess uh, to the safety theory question, I think it's an excellent question and, and we do keep an eye to that. That sort of segues into how do you, how do you engage your stakeholders? And it, is, it looks very different at the national and the local level. Uh, and in both cases, uh, outcome mapping is a, is a tool that we use to convene key stakeholders. A tremendous amount of thought is given to which stakeholders will come in and these are big meetings. Uh, and so there's, it's very inclusive, uh, diversity is key, gender equity is really important. And so um, in answer to your question, we deliberately convene groups of people that include national level, uh, that include local level. Um, and then finally, I, I love the question about, do some of these interventions work for more than one virus? Absolutely. Um, for example, if we find that one of the uh, factors in um, Liberia that increases risk of uh, loss of fever is defecation or urination of uh, the rodents that carry loss of fever on food preparation services or on water or food that are on tables inside houses that are at risk for uh, being exposed to the rodents, either in the rafters or just in the house, then if we, if we can change behavior or, or manage ways to prevent we not only prevent loss of fever, but we prevent other pathogens that may be moving with the same excrement, the same urine, the same feces. Uh, and that's true of other viral diseases as well. A good example in this country or in all countries is masks. If you are wearing a mask to prevent COVID, you're less likely to get seasonal flu because that intervention is going to prevent you from uh, being exposed at a, at a dangerous level to either one. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. I'm not quite sure who this can be directed at, but um, please, uh, you know, take a stab if you know. Uh, the question is: Is nodding disease in northern parts of Uganda a zoonotic disease? Debbie, <laughs> I see you I, smiling. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm about to click onto Google and ask Dr. Google about nodding disease. Uh, <laughs> And maybe it has a different name that I am more familiar with. Um, and this is in, was it in Uganda? Okay. Uganda, yes. Um, a form of epilepsy that occurs in children between the ages of five and 16 who live in distinct regions in a couple of countries. Um, so I do not, uh, let's see, it suggests that um, it may be caused by a uh, parasitic protein. So I don't know what parasite specifically is involved in that, um, but that would be key, right? That's the research part is to first find out what, oh, so they think it's a poten uh, potentially an Onchocerca, a parasitic worm, the same worm that causes river blindness. And so, um, so that is, um, that's a, a parasitic disease is a little different from a, a zoonotic disease. The zoonotic disease is moving from an animal to a person. And so in this case, it's the infection with the worm that's causing the disease. Okay, um, we have just last question, which is, uh, um, I see it's, it's about the safety theory and Debbie, you have just, just answered that. 
Well, that, so, that's, a, that's a complex question. I'd love to talk more with that person, but, uh, but we don't have time, so yeah. Yeah, but I, I um, you know, before, uh, I, I thank you, thank, th thanks to every panelist for, for your time and your, you know, your patience with the questions and answering them so well. Um, uh, before we actually say, uh, you know, wrap it up, uh, we have Holly Schulman with us, uh, also from Stop Spillover. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure, Holly, that there will be more questions for our panelists. Um, and we would like those question people to to ask those questions as well, especially when they, you know, they they start reporting on these issues. Uh, I know some of them already are. So, Holly, would you uh, like to uh, just turn on your 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 camera for a for a second, maybe, and then just share the the contact um, links where people could reach out to our panelists and where could they post the questions, big and small? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, sorry, I'm not sure how to turn on my camera at this point. It's giving me a little bit of a weird thing, but um, but yeah, there's a bunch of places you can go, and I'll put them in the chat. Um, I've already put a link in the chat to explain more about how we're engaging stakeholders at the national and local level. So if you want to take a look, if you're interested in that topic, feel free to um, take a look at that blog post. Um, but you can reach me on my email. It's holly.schulman at tufts.edu. Um, I'll put our social media links in the chat as well. Um, but we're happy to talk. We have experts, as Debbie mentioned, in all kinds of issues um, on a big range of things from gender and spillover um, to wildlife um, to prevention um, to disease forecasting um, and all kinds of things. So um, in all areas, um, you know, that we work um, and so um, across the world. So I'm ha happy to chat um, and connect you um, with our experts, um, including the people on this call, but also more folks um, who might have more specific information for what you're looking for. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Holly. Uh, and uh, for everyone else, I'm also just uh, posting some of the links uh, if you want to take them with you right now. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the project, uh, you know, is, is very much active on the social media, uh, so please do reach out to our panelists with any questions or, you know, even if you want to interview them moving forward. And with that, um, I would once again like to thank Nadia Arimi, uh, Debbie, Deborah Kochivar, uh, Musa Sangari. I know there have been so many technical and time uh you know related issues um that you had to <laughs> you had to endure for for being here and we are very very uh thankful to you you know this is only as they say tip of the iceberg but i'm i'm i'm, I'm happy that you at least helped us today to you know um see the how the tip looks like and probably also give a direction of you know how we can uh, move down this slope moving forward um and uh, thank you musa especially for those very uh you know very very um uh interesting and effective tips on how to keep yourself safe how to strike a balance you know between the fact and also uh not being you know uh you know pa spreading panic uh, in the community so with that, uh, we still have two minutes to go. Uh, Debbie, if you have uh, any final uh, word to share, uh, please go ahead. I would just say thank you to Internews and to all those who've uh, participated in the call today, both as, as uh, listeners and also panelists. Um, again, I said at the, at the beginning of my remarks, I think what you do is really important. And we live in an age where we see the destructiveness of misinformation. And so seeing the positive impacts of uh, properly reported information, especially when it comes to understanding and conveying science in, in effective ways, I just think that's a, a hugely important task. And I, I just commend all of you for, for doing that. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank
Thank you, uh, Debbie. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's something that we always later report that scientists were right all along. You know, <laughs> it's the governments <laughs> or the authorities, you know, uh, that, that woke up a bit late and started listening and acting late. So I just hope that on zoonotic diseases, we were caught by surprise, but, uh, you know, the scientists are right again. And this time around, uh, there will be more, uh, you know, uh, per, more more balance in in in, in the timing uh, of you know reporting it and then you know seeing some action on the ground. So with that hope, uh, you know, it's time to wrap it up and say bye to everybody. Uh, we will be reaching out to you again with the recording, and please do keep in touch uh, with with your questions uh, at the links that we shared and also when you do hear back from us. And I thank you one more time, uh, Debbie, for your time, Nadia, Musa, Holly, and to also our web host today who remained, you know, he was behind the curtain for, but thank you for all the technical support that you provided us, uh, Stefano Robleski, uh, my colleague. So thank you. And uh, yeah, good day to you, uh, those on the East Coast and uh, good evening and uh, good night to those who joined us from you know, uh, Far East. Uh, and uh, see you again very soon. Yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Yeah, Great. So, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.